Thank you. Dr. Billington, Mrs. Billington, members of Congress, distinguished guests, it's wonderful to be back at the National Book Festival. As a former trial lawyer, I'm used to public speaking, and for the most part, I enjoy it. But 11 years ago, I accepted a speaking invitation, and as soon as I did so, I regretted it. As the time grew close for me to go to this event, I became increasingly irritable, morose, and unhappy. And finally, the day came for me to go. After much soul searching and knowing that I had committed to this event, I decided to do the right thing. I asked my wife to call them and tell them I was dangerously ill. <laughs> Instead, she said, look, buddy, you're going to go to your daughter's kindergarten class. <clears throat> And you're going to talk to those five-year-olds. Now, being a strong, independent male, I did exactly as my wife said. This was parents' career day at the school, and all the moms and dads were coming in to talk about what they did. My dilemma had been made more difficult because the day before I was supposed to go in, my daughter came home from kindergarten so excited, more excited than I had ever seen her. And she said, Dad, today was the best day ever in my kindergarten career. Really, I said, why was that? She said, well, Tommy's mom came in today, and she's something called a marine biologist. I don't know what that is, but Dad, she brought live fish. <laughs> it was so cool. And then my daughter looked at me and said, what are you going to do? <laughs> you have to understand, until my daughter was around seven years old, if you asked her what her dad did for a living, she wouldn't say that I wrote books. She would say, my daddy signs his name in books and people buy every one because they like his handwriting very much. <laughs> now, continuing on, she said, Dad, if you come to school tomorrow, you cannot write in the books or you're going to get a timeout. <laughs> so with that added pressure, I trudged off to school the next day, but I didn't go alone. I took with me the movie poster for Absolute Power, one of my films, novels turned into a film. I wanted to talk to the kids about how books can be turned into pictures and other things, other creative elements. I also took with me my foreign language editions, a whole stack of them, as my ace in the hole, because I knew as a trial lawyer I needed to have a backup in case things went to hell fast in kindergarten. <laughs> So I went to the class, I sat down on the floor with 25 five-year-olds gathered around me. We talked about books and how much fun it was to read and their favorite characters, and we really did have a great time, you know, for two and a half minutes, <laughs> which is the average attention span of a five-year-old, and which I've since learned is two minutes and 15 seconds longer than the average attention span of a teenager. Then I pulled out the movie poster, and we talked about how books can be turned into pictures, and again, we had a great conversation once again for another two and a half minutes. Then Jane was looking at Timmy's belly button, and two boys were writing on the chalkboard, and a little girl was wandering around staring at the ceiling and talking to it, seeing things there obviously I could not. That's when I pulled out my ace in the hole, my foreign language editions. I said, okay, boys and girls, we're going to play a game now. It's called Guess the Language. I'm going to hold up the stack of books, one by one, and you have to guess the language before we move on to the next book. I figured this would make me golden for the 25 minutes I was scheduled to be with them. All eyes turned to me as they eagerly awaited the first book. I held it up. A little boy in the back said immediately, that's Spanish. I said, okay. I conceded that one was pretty easy. I put it down and picked up the next one. A little girl said, that's Korean. A little shaken, I put that one down and picked up another book. The boy in the back said, that's Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> I put that one down and picked up another. A little girl with two ponytails said, that's Hebrew. I glanced at the cover and thought, so that's what that one is. <laughs> They just send me the books. They don't tell me what the language is. <laughs> I went through the next 10 books in about 12 seconds, the kids knowing each one immediately until they only had one left. And I said, OK, I bet nobody can guess this one. And I held the book up with a flourish. 
I remember this scene so vividly, even though it took place over 10 years ago. A little girl stood up, hands on hips. She was glowering at me like I was the biggest dunce she'd ever seen. And she said, that's Latvian. <laughs> Anybody here read Latvian? <laughs> Later, their teacher told me, you know, Mr. Baldacci, this school is in the suburb of Washington, D.C., and 20 foreign languages are spoken here. I looked at the woman for about a minute before I said, thanks for telling me. <laughs> so there I was with 24 minutes to go and no magic bullets left. I thought furiously, come on, you were a trial lawyer. You were paid to think on your feet. Come up with something. They're only little kids. And finally, I hit on the perfect solution. I looked out at the kids and I smiled and I said, does anyone have any questions? Don't ever do that with five-year-olds <laughs> unless you don't care about having a shred of self-respect left. One pretty little girl in the front row stood up, frantically waving her hand. I pointed to her and I said, oh, do you have a question? She said proudly, no, I don't have a question. She proceeded to tell a highly personal and highly embarrassing story about her mother. I mean highly personal and highly embarrassing <laughs> in a delightful way that only a five-year-old can manage to do. After she finished, I found myself literally struck dumb. I stared horrified at her while she smiled shyly back at me. I finally looked over at the teacher for support and found her staring at the ceiling, <laughs> shaking her head in disbelief, no doubt wondering why in the world I had opened the, que the floor for questions with five-year-olds. I finally looked back at the kids. I found my voice. I told my daughter to sit down. <laughs> and please to never speak again while I was still alive which I would not be very much longer if my wife and her mother ever found out about this. Now, those same little kids will be going to college in two years, along with thousands of others across the country. Now, if current trends continue when they graduate, over 70% of them will never read another book. Over 80% will never read a newspaper. For those who don't go into college and their numbers are growing, those statistics are even more appalling. Now, they will join an adult population in the United States where half of the adults read at the two lowest levels of literacy. Those folks can't read a grocery list, much less a newspaper or a novel or a health care reform bill. And over three quarters of the adults in this country who can read never do. No less a person than Steve Jobs, the head of Apple Computer, on being asked his reaction to the competitive force of the Amazon Kindle e-reader to his own product said, I don't care about the Kindle because no one in America reads anymore. At my family's Wish You Well Foundation, we've funded literacy programs in over 40 states in just the last seven years. With our program, Feeding Body and Mind, we partnered with Feeding America, runs all the nation's food banks. During my book tours and the book tours of authors who have joined with me, we collect books at every event that we do and then ship those books to food banks across the country. In just over three years, we've donated over 400,000 books to food banks across the United States so people seeking food assistance can also go home with books. I personally have never known anything bad coming out of the fact of a book being in a home. And we intend to build those numbers into the millions. Now there are thousands of other organizations like ours who are doing all they can to combat illiteracy across America. But unfortunately, we are clearly, clearly losing the battle. We live in a world now where there are greater quantities of information available faster than ever before. And yet, we seem to know less and less about more and more. What's dangerous about this lack of basic knowledge is that it leaves us defenseless against people who have built lucrative careers around telling us what we should think and believe. I explored that theme in The Whole Truth, a novel I wrote two years ago. The main plot revolved around a perception manager using mainstream media, the internet, and orchestrating events on the ground to manipulate millions of people into believing that a lie was true. 